Hello everybody, now that Splatoon 2 is finally out, I've played through it and had a couple days to formulate my thoughts. And I wanted to talk about one particular aspect that let me down. The final boss battle, or more specifically, the final boss battle in direct comparison to Splatoon 1's final battle. Obviously, endgame spoiler warning, so watch at your own risk. One thing I want to make clear, cinematically Splatoon 2's final boss is awesome. Each story beat works in an incredible progression to victory, from the lowest point, beginning with Callie helping Octavio, to the point where it all turns around and you've got the Squid Sisters back together singing Karamari Incantation! And you get the friggin' Rainmaker to take Octavio down once and for all. I wouldn't change a thing about it. What I would change is the actual design of the gameplay. You know, the part where the player presses the buttons and video game things happen. Here's what every boss fight in Splatoon 2 looks like. Boss 1, circular arena in which you fight a big monster. Boss 2, circular arena in which you fight a big monster. Boss 3, circular arena in which you fight a big monster. Boss 4, circular arena in which you fight a big monster. And hey, they actually switch it up this time. There's towers to climb and use as cover. Final boss! Circular arena in which you fight a big monster. It's exactly the same, and kind of even a step back from Boss 4, which at least had some architectural variation. You're fighting in exactly the same arena as you've already seen four times before, and fighting an enemy who's mechanically no more interesting than those prior battles. Like, having an uninteresting environment could be forgivable if he was mechanically interesting to fight on his own. But you might even argue that he's less interesting than most of the prior bosses. The Toaster and Octo Stomp require you to actually climb on top of them before you can hurt them. With Octavio, you don't stand next to the projectiles he shoots, and don't stand in front of him when he moves towards you. That's it. He technically has different projectiles, but all of them just follow the same formula of Don't stand near me or you'll die! So you're essentially only dodging two attacks for most of the fight. Either Octavio throws a thing at you and you sidestep it, or Octavio moves towards you and you sidestep him. The only gameplay variation comes for the final segment when you get the Rainmaker, which kind of is even worse as awesome of a set piece as it is. You're locked on a grind rail and it's essentially become a one-dimensional game. You dodge his one and only attack by pressing one button at the right time. And sometimes that attack will hurt him after you fire a single shot at it. It's a glorified quick time event. Now, let's take a look at Splatoon 1's bosses. Like Splatoon 2, there are four boss fights. Boss 1, giant monster in a circular arena. Boss 2, giant monster in a circular arena. Boss 3, giant monster in a circular arena. Boss 4, giant monster in a circular arena. Boss 5, giant monster who locks you into a very small area on a fully complete platforming level. You have no room to move until you damage him by shooting one of his direct punch attacks. But he also has homing missiles, enemy spawners, and even a killer whale, which makes a large part of the level instant death if touched. After hitting Octavio, he gets pushed back. You have to continuously follow him and keep pushing him back all the while keeping your footing in this limited space, having to worry about dodging his varied projectiles and the standard enemies that appear. After pushing him to the edge of each section, you go into a tennis match with his last projectile, even while all the other projectiles are trying to kill you and painting over the ground, limiting your movement options. After hitting the tennis ball multiple times in a row, you'll advance to the next section of the platforming level, and every section reintroduces mechanics the player is seen throughout the game's campaign. Fan-powered moving platforms, sponges, puffer fish, invisible platforms, geysers, and railways. It gives the player a totally new kind of challenge they've never seen in this game before, but at the same time is mechanically testing them on the same skills they've built up throughout the game. Some final bosses switch things up too much from the base game to the point you feel like you're playing a completely different game. None of the skills you've learned throughout a platforming game mean anything if the final boss is a shoot 'em up and other final battles are just too similar to every prior encounter in that game, meaning the final boss doesn't stand out at all. That's where Octavio in Splatoon 2 stands. You need a mixture of gameplay challenges testing abilities the player has already learned and a new, interesting scenario which recontextualizes them. DJ Octavio in Splatoon 1 does this flawlessly, sitting right in the middle and is one of the best examples of how to do a final boss in gaming history.
Thank you for listening, guys, to uh, the second in my apparent series of videos about how I was disappointed by final bosses in Nintendo games. Let me know your own opinions on the final battles of both Splatoon games in the comments. DJ Octavio in Splatoon 1 is legit probably my favorite boss of all time, and I'd like to see what the general consensus is on that. And of course, let me know how much this video sucks in the comments too. And tune in in a few months when I'll inevitably be complaining about Super Mario Odyssey's final battle. Arigato gozaimasu desu for watching, and get out of my house.